Okay. So, so this is the Mishnah. Rabbi Lozer HaKapar Omer. Yeah, because in those days, rabbis had day jobs. Um, Hakina Hatav of Akavod. That's jealousy, desire, and honor. Motzi and Esa Adam and Olam take a person out of the world. And uh, both the Maharal and and the Gra assume that Taiva is um, physical desires. Right? So um, the, we saw that the Gra had taken Kina and Kavod, jealousy and honor, and said that they were um, signs of a flawed Ruach, of a flawed ego. Right, that the mind, the thinking part of the person had a flaw, and and that's where jealousy and honor come from. Whereas taiva is from a flawed nefesh, a flawed, um, you know, more basic life soul. Um, because the gra didn't want to assign any of these to a flawed neshama, as we say in the bracha in the morning, elokai neshama shenasatabi. My God, the, the the neshama which you placed in me, Tahorahi, is pure in the present tense. Not you gave me a pure neshama. My neshama is pure. And the gra is running with the idea that, that the neshama can't be tainted. So there is no negative desire of a flawed neshama in the way the gra views the, the three. And therefore... Two of them are attributed to the to the um, the ruach, which, if you remember the way he did the medrash, that's the castle in the air, which he tied to the prophecy of the two women flo- trapping the one woman in a in a tub and flying away with her. These are the two women are are Kinan. Uh, Kina and Kavod and Taiva is the one woman that they trap. That's just a refresher of the growth. The morale takes it in a different direction. Kina Taiva the Kavod Hulu. Yesh So one could ask. It is, you know, there's room to ask. Matam Elu Gimel Shahimotsi and Asa Adam and Olam. What is the reason that these three take a person out of the world? So first he takes it to a side question, just to dismiss it. Vim kibivadai ein lahakshos. You could you should, certainly should not ask. Mamar ze al mamar Rabbi Yeshua. From this Mishnah to that of Rabbi Yeshua, who says in Parapay's Mishnah Yudalif, ayin hara v'yetar ha v'sinas abrios, Ayin hara is a stingy eye. I mean, it's a bad eye, but usually it's it's understood to be stinginess or jealousy. Um, but yeter hara, known, sinas habrios and hating people, being misanthropic, motzinas olam olam take a person out of the world. So you shouldn't ask that. Uh, uh, you know, how this Mishnah works with that Mishnah. Rabbi Dosa ben Hurkanus Omer, Shina Shil Shachris, sleeping in the morning, Yayin Shel Tzarayim, Chulu Motzina Sa'odam Olam, you know, the person who sleeps the morning, drinks the afternoon, basically somebody who doesn't try to accomplish anything in this world, takes himself out of the world. So um, I, I kind of think Rabbi Dozer Ben Harkness is busy focused on taiva or maybe laziness. Whereas Ayin Hara Yitzhara and Sinas Abrios is, is more just straight, you know, evil and interpersonal stuff. The mm-hmm. Evsha Lomar yeah. Day drinking is not a good sign. Well, day drinking could literally take you out of this world. Uh-huh. Um, a, I mean, like, you know, a, a meaning style. Uh, so why shouldn't you ask about these other 
Mishnayos that list things that could take a person out of the world. Hershalama, you could simply say, Dechol Hani Melzinus Olam, Adam in Olam. All of them can take a person out of the world. Lo Kashmidi, and there's no question from this. Minyana Lo Katani, the Mitna doesn't say these three things like it's a complete canonical list. Devada Minyana Lamu Uteyasa, because had it given him a, a, a number, then it would mean these three specifically and, not, and nothing else. Avalkan um, Lotani Minyana. Here, there's no number. Avalkasha, but we do have a question. My time, Elu Gimel Motsin is Odom in Olam. What is the unifying theme of this list? What makes it that these three things take a person out of the world? So he's asking something slightly different than I started with. He's asking, why are these three things qualified for taking? a person out of the world, and I'm saying, why are these three a set? Right? Like, whatever mechanism it is that they take somebody out of the world, they have to operate in some kind of parallel way because they're being grouped together by uh, Rabbi Lazar Kapar. Mm -hmm. So now, now to the question he does want to address. Dalicha, you should know. A person who's a lot, a person being a living being, yeshlo nefesh has a nefesh, because a nefesh is something animals also have. So, given that people are mammals, we have a nefesh. Right? Anything that's alive has to have the necessary drives to stay alive and perpetuate the species. By nefesh hazos, yeshla kochos mechulakos. This all has different um, abilities, different potentials. Shapoalos be'elu kochos ulos mechulakos. That um, does different things with these different abilities. Kamosha be'arna lamala kamem pa'arim, like we've seen already a number, like we've explained a number of times, but We've seen it in this Chabura a number of times. Because of a Rambam Sal, so the Rambam writes about in his book Shmona Parakim, which is his introduction to Pirkei Avos. Shesam Rosh Harofim, that the, that the head of all doctors, which I believe means Galen, mm-hmm. right? Galen placed Tashala Sifro in the beginning of his book, Shanafasho Shalosh, that there are three souls. Tivis, the natural soul, Chionis, the living soul, and Nafshis, the spiritual soul. Moshe is bar Lamala Beperak Remiober, like we discussed in the earlier Mishnah. Who's Al Kasov, but the Ramam himself writes, Shana Davarkach. A person does not have three souls. Aval nefesh yachas, the soul is one. Rakshi yeshla kochos mechulakos, but it has different abilities, different powers. Shapulasa bekochos shehim pulas mechulakos. Its action is through these different powers, these different abilities or potentials. Koach means both potential and force. Like we say, from the potential to the actual, but it's also the word for force or power. Um, what that says about the rabbinic mind and potential versus power is interesting, but I don't you know. It's how it's deeper than anything I know on the subject. But there's one soul. So whereas Galen said that there are three souls, actually he said there are four. Because there's the the inanimate soul that a rock would have, but he doesn't he doesn't even consider that a soul. Um, but the three souls that living things have, right? The plant, the the animal, and the human. He's he's just, I mean, assuming it is Galen, those are the three souls that living beings have, and he's saying it's the natural soul, the living soul, and the spiritual soul. But these are not actually three different souls, but three different groups of things a single 
indivisible soul does. So there are three sets of verbs, three sets of powers, but only one soul. There, I think the reason for insist for the Ramam insisting there's only one soul is um, because we're in the image of God. And the second he, if there are multiple souls, then you got to ask which one is in the image of God, right? Okay. You can't have the image of God being different parts working together. Although you already have the image of God having multiple disparate cohos. We want it to be as close to unity, to divine unity as, as the model will allow. So far so good? Okay. Barry, Inyan, Gimel, Kochos, Elu. Let's explain what these three forces are. Koach Tivi, the natural force. Well, Koach Shemekabel has Zonashodam Nizon. It accepts the nourishment that a person consumes. Bidochel Mosaros Hateva. And pushes away the, the extraneous. Megadel as a goof and causes the body to grow. Baorech. In height, uberochav, in Weight Watchers, kasher hu, as it is. Mikoach zeh ba hataiva liznus, and this this koach has the has the desire that leads to um, illicit relations. Shahu al yidei mosare hateva, because it comes from an excess of the natural self. Shemim vashel koach zeh. Which cooks this this power. So if somebody is overly animalistic, then that power gets overcooked, and it boils over as as a desire for licentiousness. And the entire natural force. Comes from uh, comes from the from this um, this power, which is the the natural. Mishkan who and and this this power sits in the liver, rests in the liver. You'd really think from his introduction about gaining nourishment and throwing out the. the so less the unnecessary. You would have really thought it was the kidneys, but no, he says it's the liver. I can't comment on this because while heart still has metaphoric meaning in modern English, livers don't have any metaphoric meaning anymore. I looked at the gay one, so I don't really remember. Uh huh. When we were doing uh, uh, Elu Trefos in a uh, Gemara Chabura in the neighborhood. Ah. This is just trying to figure out what Chazal were thinking about in terms of you know, animal physiology. Makes sense. Um, yeah, although the in thing nowadays would be to go check what the, what the assassinates thought about animal biology because yeah. the the, the, the Babylonianess of the of the Talmud has been a big academic topic lately. Um, but in any, any case, um, the second force in a person who is the is the life force. Uh, I didn't translate that well, but I don't know what else to call it. Right, so we're we're somehow or another dividing the natural force from the life force. Well, you take Adam who is no makom. That's how a person can move from one place to another. Because remember, Galen called this the you know, the the you know the, the the first level of soul plants have. So the second level of soul is where motion starts coming in, because that's that's distinct to animals. And from there, we get... Tropisms, yeah. And, yeah, but it's not really moving. I mean, I kind of see that. Yeah. Slowly. Yeah, okay. I mean, it grows in a particular direction more than... Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Rumenu Mishadesh, and from it is re, um, is born or emerge, whatever. Is it is a nude? It's not renewed, so I don't know what to call it. Hanakima, revengefulness, Natira, um, spite, Kina, jealousy, Sina, hatred. Mishkana Kawachaze, who believe? And that sits in the heart, Shishama Kawachaze. Gimel who koach nafshi. The third one is the power of the soul, of the spiritual soul. A koach haze yavo mimenu kochos harpe, and from this this one power is the source of many of many powers, many abilities. Kama kochos hachushim hachamisha, the five senses, the koach hamachshava, the power to think vadimion. And to um, imagination, yeah, but it's more than imagination. It's also perception. To ma- to Greeks, the ability to imagine something that doesn't exist, and the ability to perceive something that does exist, is a single making yeah. an image in your head. Mm-hmm. Now, your philosophers today would talk about more like qualia than imagination, right? The ability to experience red as opposed to just Knowing the fact that it's red. Vazikara mm-hmm. memory, vasechel, and and reason, and you know the mind. Umishkan karzeb the moach, and logically enough, this ability is seated in the brain. Sof sof she chiluk kochos lenefesh. So all in all, there's a division of of powers in the soul. So Chazal also divided these kochos. Like I did already a number, a lot of number times. So he's actually, I think, uh, dividing them. He's saying that Galen and the Rambam went in one direction. Where the where they really only differ. Oh, Ariel has been waiting. Uh-huh. Galen and Rabam went in one direction, but they really only differ as to whether it's three entities or one entity that had three functions. And now he's saying Razal also divided these kochos. Kamoshe is barer lecha kamapam imod keachelaka echad im kochos agufi gufaniim. One is bodily um, forces. One is spiritual forces. But I think when they say that they also divided these these kochos, these forces or potentials, um, he um, he did not mean they're using the same division. He's explicitly saying they took the same set of forces and divided them this way. Moshe was here. He, he'd forced me to justify that claim better than I did just now. I missed my foil. It's nice to have somebody who argues when I make something controversial. But no, I mean, it's, it's and then he gives a different three categorizations. That's where, that's where I got it from. The commercial be like we saw by the three crowns. Ayin Sham, you could look there or you could, hopefully your memory goes back a week. Bekama Mekomos, and in a number of places, Osam, Ruach Nefesh Neshama. These are the, that's the term for the, right, the Ruach keeps the body alive. Nefesh keeps, the, is, has the, no, Ruach has the mind, Nefesh keeps the body alive. That's why animals, we say, Ki Adam Hu Nefesh. You can't eat the blood of an animal because that's where the life of the animal is. Nishtama and the soul. And it's appropriate to call him that, which is a very ironic thing because he doesn't. Lefi Chiluk Elu Shalosh Kochos. And by this division of these three uh, forces or potentials, Amru, they said in our Mishnah, 
Adam and Olam. So these three things operate in the same way. And they are three items that belong as a set because one's, one is undermines the Ruach, one the Nefesh, one the Nesham. Since the soul, not the nefesh in the ruach nefesh neshama sense, but the soul, you know, as we'd call it in English, it has these three forces which we said above. And if you exceed, if somebody has an excess of one of these forces, he leaves the world. A person is in the world um, through the ages of these three forces. Okay, three forces. Now he does it in each, right? A person is in the world through his spiritual ability and if he has too much of it it ends up it ends up a minus and it ends up a loss a person's soul has a proper measure of everything and if it leaves that measure with an excess which is what he just said a line ago if you add too much, it's it's a negative. This is kind of like the Ramam's middle measure, right? In the sense that too much of Amida is bad, but it's less um, specifically a middle. It's more like the introduction to Orchot Sadikim, where he where the author just says everything has a proper measure. Right, and some some midos are like meat, where that measure should be large, and yeah, um, and some midos are like spices, where the proper measure is small. But if you want to make a good dish, you have to know the proper measure of each of the ingredients, which would also fit these words. Um, Jordy, not only is there is Aristotle's middle measure Aristotelian of him. He actually, in the Mora, um, cites the Nick, uh, Nicomachean Ethics. Thank you. I My mouth wasn't getting the syllables out. Yeah, I mean, well, he actually Nick. says, he, he explicitly says his sources. Uh, well, he doesn't actually say his sources, Aristotle. He says, Aristotle, that brilliant guy, came up with the same thing as our tradition. <laughs> there are Goldilocks. That's perfect. Uh, yes, that's the deep inner meaning of the Goldilocks story. Um, jealousy, which comes from the spiritual drive. Because we already said that jealousy comes from the spirit. This is a, an additional action of the soul. Why would a person naturally be jealous of something that's not his? Therefore, kina is an additional force. Now, if you read it in a Okay, well, I'll do the third one and then pause. No, um, no, 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 sorry, sorry. That was just the first one. So I want to just stop there. Um, this whole business he's raising that an excess of any of these forces would take a person out of this world matches what he was saying on the um, three cardinal sins back when we were talking about the pillars of the world. Right, that the reason why one of those sins is worth dying rather than committing is because if a person has a defective 
avoda of defective relationship with with the Almighty, then his life has no point. He's again saying that there's three. It's the same three. And in excess, right, he's saying these are three excesses. Ex these are three ways of being excessive. And any one of these ways of being excessive would take you out of this world because, you know, the excess is itself a flaw. Tava, similarly desire, Shumi Tzad TV, which comes from a person's natural force. Shehum is Ava Ladavar Shalo Hayat Sarakla Adam. It's a desire that's not a need. It's an interesting definition of Taiva. If you think how much time we discuss nowadays about the difference between desire and need, right? He's defining Taiva as wanting something that's not a need. Although we will see it's something physical. It's an excess of this natural. So it's okay to want physical needs that are actually needs. But physical need, physical desires that are not needs, that is the taiva that can take one out of this world. And therefore, it exceeds the measure, the, the boundary that's appropriate for it. And therefore, it ends up again a flaw, a negative. Any force or ability from these ability from these forces, when it exceeds what is needed and what is appropriate, maybe brings um, a lack and death. So the first time. You know, when we were talking about Kina, he just said it wasn't Roy to him. It belongs to somebody else. Now he adds, ain't sarich, ain't Roy. The flaw in, in Taiva is not whether or not it's appropriate, it's whether or not it's necessary. Whereas the flaw in, in jealousy is that you're, you want something that's not appropriate. And honor, well, that is an excess of, of the, you know, uh, it's an excess of an ability or force of the mind. Because it's the intellect that wants honor. It is for this measure, for this level, that this person, that this force wants kavod. Because it's the mind that is the most respectful and dignified part of a person. Like, uh, like Shlomo Melch writes in Mishlei, the wise inherit honor. Kavod belongs to the mind. Because it's a, it's a spiritual need, it's a ruach thing. It's not a physical thing. Therefore, it belongs with the mind. Opposite its opposite his elders is honor. So you see that kavod is something that belongs to elders. Because they're also the people of Seichel. Stand before the the um, seva, the quarry, H O A R Y. How do they normally translate seva? The aged. What I'll go with. and give glory to the face of the of the zakain, the ein zakain, ella zeshakana chachma. And the definition of a zakin is ze. You see the Zion shekana chachma. Please give your seat to the elderly or handicapped. 
Yeah, except it doesn't say old, uh, handicapped. Yeah, I mean, because no, because please give you a seat to the elderly. The, yeah, I know, but please give you a seat to the elderly. The handicapped is a statement of need. Yeah, right. You're not giving up as much as they're gaining. So, you know, <laughs> don't be a person of Sodom who who needs to stand on their rights at somebody else's expense. Right. But no, this is he's focusing on the fact that they've earned it, right? Somebody who's developed their mind is an honorable person. She calls him all of this um, indicates or proves that kavod is appropriate for the intellectual force. The kasher who yotzim in a sheer bird defas a kavod yosem in a roi. When somebody chases on him more than is appropriate, um, it's interesting. I'm curious to know what chisaron. Chisaron's a lack in Eder is a diminishing. But I don't really understand the what he's trying to connote by doubling the language. I personally would have said that Kavod belongs to the intellect for another reason. And that is because... Um, Conscious thought is is it's the same reason why ego is called ego, right? The the self and the and 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 gava have the same word in English, right? They're both right ego and egotism, right? Um, the thing that wants honor is my I, right? Is, is my selfness. So I kind of thought that 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 I mean to me that 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 would unify kavod with thought because um, but he's saying no kavod appropriately belongs with thought thought is honorable and other modes of existence not so much and brings psukim to reinforce or buttress his point although sometimes I wonder I mean not in this case. Sometimes I wonder whether the Maharal is buttressing his point or providing mnemonics. Uh, like, did he expect this to prove the point to his listener or did he just want it to stick in his listener's head by giving them a verse that connects the two? But in this case, I mean, clearly, they say we're talking about Dr. Penezokane is about showing honor to the elderly. I mean, that's not, you know, and the fact that somebody is a zakin and not yashin, um, that term for old does connote wisdom, like elder does, as opposed to elderly. Klala <laughs> davar, um, the overarching principle. Ki al yidei elu gimel davarim, hanefesh shal adam, yotzei migvul shalo asherori lanefesh. These are three excesses where the soul exceeds the boundaries of what is appropriate for the soul. Therefore, it uses the language take the, him out of the world. He goes out with these three things. The olam to be in this world would be to be within your place and taking up no more than your place. That was for Tina's benefit. Uh, you know, if Al, Alan was here a couple of weeks while, while you were gone, Tina, he, he would have appreciated my, my invoking his line. Therefore, with them, a person uh, is taken out of the world or leaves the world. And, and now it's all clear. So what he's saying is in this Mishnah that these three forces are each associated with a different one of the three. So he doesn't do the Gruz double teaming that there are two negative aspects. There are two ways the 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 um, Gruach, the castle in the air, could be flawed. He says, no, one is one is a flaw of of the Ruach, one's a flaw of the Nefesh, one's a flaw of the Neshama, and the flaws are all excesses. 
it's beyond the the limits that are appropriate for it right and going beyond one's limit is going out and going out of this world and that's why there could be other lists because there could be other ways to 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 destroy the the or or to permanently damage the ruach the nefesh or the neshama right like uh like murder but um assuming one isn't murdering for honor desire or or jealousy um right that would be right so there are other ways to destroy each of these three um but these are the three excesses and when rabbi lezer our shoemaker is um is just listing the three excesses excesses as ways to um, take oneself out of the world. Okay. Questions, thoughts, anything? Okay. So now we're going to go in a very different direction. Um, or what seems a very different direction. So this is this is from Collected Writings, Volume 3, which is titled Jewish Symbolism. And in it, Rev Hirsch discusses a symbolic interpretation to a number of mitzvot which are called osos, or otot, uh, depending upon what you're used to hearing. Um, signs. So he doesn't go as far as he does in Chorev, where like most of the mitzvot have some symbolic component. He discusses the symbolic component of mitzvot that he feels that because they're called osos, are called symbols. By being called signs. So um, I really was tempted to also do bris mila. Um, but since he mentions Brismila further down, I decided to just stick to this one quote. The point to bring this up is to give some tangibility to everything we've been discussing. So till now, we've gotten pretty philosophical. Maybe it's changed your or, or, or you know, modified your self-image. This idea that we exist at the conflict point. Right at the at the battlefront, as Rav Dessler would say. Um, Rav Dessler talks about, by the way, the, the battlefront between truth and falsehood. But Rav Dessler's definition of truth is not um, corresponds to reality, but corresponds to what God would have wanted reality to be if it wasn't for free will. Um, in other words, it, it, when 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 Rav Dessler says MS, he means um, an idealized reality, not reality. Um, I'm not really sold on it. it. To me, it sounds like he's transvaluing the terms, but that is what he that is what he holds. When he talks about the battlefront between truth and falsehood, he's talking about battlefront between the drive in a person to make a world that corresponds to God's plan versus the drives in a person. That make the that take the world further from God's plan. You could say MS versus Metzius. But he doesn't. He says MS versus Shekhar. <laughs> um, okay. No, because because it it's right. It's sort of it's sort of MS is not the world as it is, because the world is a world of illusion. It's the world as it should be. The reason why the world's a world of illusion is because people have a job to do. Um and therefore, his definition of MS is not the naive definition of MS. And when he says MS versus Sheker in that, so in any case, um, he defines where the ego is and where the self is as that place of conflict. And if we look in the Maral and the Gra, the place of conflict is where body and soul meet, which is the mind. So the mind and the intellect and ego and egotism and maybe jealousy all arise from the fact that, you know, you know, there, there, are peop- there are thinkers who see a person as a soul that lives in a body and they seem to be saying a person is what emerges when you try to 
be both soul and body. Right? Being both soul and body creates that conflict that makes the battlefront that Rav Dessler was talking about. And therefore, the Ruach, where thinking happens, the castle in the air, is the middle. Which is exactly the Fred Flintstone image I started with, right? There's the angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other shoulder, and Fred himself is the conflicted. The person making the decision identifies himself with the conflicted one in the middle. Uh, Rabbi Bechoffer, by the way, has an essay about um, about the snake and Jiminy Cricket. So Jiminy Cricket, uh, the author, of, I don't remember his name, but the author of Pinocchio, the book, um, did not really have a high opinion of children, particularly of boys, um, in case you couldn't tell from that donkey scene. And um, and as somebody who didn't have a high opinion of of boys, he kind of sets up. He assumes that the boy is e- that Pinocchio is evil, and his Yetzer Tov is something outside of himself. So he's set up to fail, really, because he's set up to I want to do this, this, and this, which is the wrong thing, and I got somebody outside nagging me to do the right thing. There's parenting advice in there, but as my youngest daughter is about to graduate high school, it's a little late for me. But um, but there is parenting advice some there so in there in that if you become the naggy one, you're identifying good with something external to the person. They're going to see their self as the bad side. The good is an outsider that is uh, that is that is pushing them around, right? Whereas in the Garden of Eden, but the snake was an externalized Yitzhahara, and Adam was set up to identify with his Yitzhahara Tov. And then Rabbi Bechavater spends a lot of time talking about um, broken shul dynamics, where the rabbi's job is to be the Jiminy Cricket, and the people talk all their way through shul and leave to drink and do this or this thing that they know they're not supposed to do and that thing that they're not supposed to be do. But the rabbi yells at them and they feel guilty about it, so it's all good. Um, that's basically, that's the essay. Now you'd have to read it. Um, Jewish observers had a print anyway. Um, but in any case, so, so that, that, that was what we've really seen so far. And we've seen different versions of this, of this three-fold, you know, th- Thesis, antithesis, and dialectic in the middle. Um, but let's talk about what that, you know, like, like how that would be reflected in actual, like, halacha. And that's something that, that Rev Hirsch does in his symbology, because by his symbology is taking hashkafic ideas and saying that they're in, that the halacha encodes a way to internalize those hashkafic ideals. Um, we could discuss when, well, I would like to discuss later why I was more enthralled with, with Rev Hirsch and I have, have, my opinion of him has changed over the years. But in any case, um, here he's talking about, right, so I was saying he's coming from a very different place. And what he's doing here is he's taking Ashkafic ideas and calling them symbols and showing how they're symbols in the mitzvot. Um, in Chorev, the beginning of Chorev, a mere 150 page introduction to Chorev, written by Diane Grunfeld, he has about five or six pages about Hirsch's copy of the Zohar. And it seems that much of Chorev started out being notes in the margins of Rav Hirsch's Zohar. So you think of Rav Hirsch as this uber rationalist. And he very well could be, because there are rationalist ways of interpreting the Zohar. Um, but it turns out that this, this symbolism that we're about to see may be coming from the same place that the Gros coming from. 
he just talks in, in terms of symbols, but he's but he's pulling from the same sources. But enough introduction for, for um, you know, talking about what Rav Hirsch says, and let's look at what Rav Hirsch actually says. So we're coming in in the middle of the mitzvah of tzitzis. I grayed out the part that had nothing to do with threes. But now it's new, I'll, so now sealed chelas, the blue thread. Now it's new, tzitzis, how can sealed chelas? Should be familiar from Shema. Put on the, the tassel of the corner, a blue string. The tchelas color, which tradition describes as blue-violet, is mentioned in God's law only in connection with the sanctuary. The high priest, so the Kohen Gadol wore a me'il klil tchelas. The me'il, the mantle, was entirely tchelas. When the Aron HaKodesh traveled before the Bnei Yisrael in their wanderings through the, de- the wilderness, through the Midbar, it was covered with a beged klil tchelas milmala. So the aron was covered in tchelas. The outer covering was entirely tchelas. The other accessories of the, of the mishkan, the shulchan, the menorah, the altar of incense, notice that the, what, he's, what he's, he's revisiting here. The aron, which is the crown of, of chachma and of the ruach, the crown of Torah and of the Ruach, that has tchelas on the outside. The Shulchan, the menorah, which is the Keser Shem Tov, and the altar of incense, which is the Keser of Avoda, of Kuna, and all the other utensils were covered with an inner covering of tchelas, but they didn't have tchelas on the outside. Thus, the coin Gadol and the Aron appeared draped in tchelas. So the 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 trellisness of the Kohen Gadol and the Aron was obvious to the observer. Similarly, we note sealed trellis, threads and loops of trellis, wherever separate objects had to be connected or bound together for the purpose of the, the sanctuary. The urios, that's the 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 um, cloth roof, were joined in one piece by lulaos trellis. 50 loops of trellis. They were kind of like hooks that, that connected these, these blue loops or violet loops. The high priest, the coin gadol's, uh, the Hoshin of the coin gadol was joined to his aphod with the sealed trellis, uh, threads of trellis to form one inseparable unit. So the Hoshin was attached to the aphod again with, with, um, Blue ribbon, and the tzitz was was uh, also worn by the coin gadol. Was held on by sealed chelas, a blue thread or a blue ribbon. We may insert here a conjecture regarding the significance of the Hebrew names of the colors. We find only three terms. Hey, what a shock! Um, <laughs> there are three terms for colors in. Uh, of the spectrum in uh, because he's he's eliminating white and black by saying of the spectrum. A dome for red, yarok for yellow and green, and tchelet for blue and violet. So the three primary colors, whether we mean the primary colors for light or the primary colors for paint, for absorption, um, are each separate words in the Chumash. The only other form now. Now he's going to explain each of the three roots. Oh, the only a, pardon. Well, there's some pardon? theory that uh, people didn't know what blue was that, uh, in antiquity, but you know it seems to me that if we have tequila as you know description and right, color, right, well, <laughs> right. No, what blue is blue is of these colors. Blue is the last. Um, Name word of the primary colors. It's the you know like in an old language that only has two terms for color. It's black and red. Mm-hmm. And then there's three terms for colors: black, red, and green. Mm-hmm. So blue. It's not really that they didn't know what blue was. It was that's like saying you know you don't know what pink is because you call it light red. Yeah. It wasn't a separate concept. That obviously their eyes 
had the same rods and cones ours did. Ours do. I mean, it wasn't like a, they just didn't think of it. But it does turn out that color perception is influenced by um, the language you speak. So the Himba people of Nigeria have one word for green and blue that is a light green and blue and one word for dark green and blue. And there's a color test and you can find it online all over the place. If you look up Himba color test where one in one circle, the aqua square is obviously a different shade than the other ones. And another one, they all look the same shade of green. But a Himba person notices the difference in darkness in the second circle more than they notice the difference between green and aqua. And so they have a hard time picking out which one's different on the left because their words teach them, like our words teach us what differences to pay attention to. So perception does end up changing with your words. And I think that's where they start talking about don't know what blue is. But anybody who looked up at the sky knows what blue is. I mean, it's not, you know, let's not over. Mm-hmm. It's fun to overstate things because it gets you published. But, you know, let, let's be honest here. I mean, people knew what blue was. They just didn't think of it as different than, you know, aqua or green or whatever. But by the time, but biblical Hebrew had blue. That's why he's arguing. It's possible to argue no. It's possible to argue that Tcheles is a wool of a certain dye and not a specific word for blue. Yeah. And like Kahol is um, Kahol is a particular chemical that was used for eyeshadow and eye medicine. And um, it's actually the Arabic becomes alcohol because they used alcohol to turn a powder into a something applicable. Um, but kahol is, you know, or orange. Orange was the name of a fruit before it was the name of a color. Peach was the name of a fruit before it was the name of a color. It's possible to argue that tchelet is blue wool and doesn't actually mean the name of a color yet in Chumash. But that's not Rav Hirsch's position. And whichever it is, the point is still that um, it stands as a different symbol. So whether whether there were three words for the spectrum or not, we have three symbols, Adom, Yorok, and Tcheles. Mm-hmm. Whether Tcheles meant something other than wool that was dyed by a chilazon to mean blue and violet as colors or not, um, Rav Hirsch has one opinion. Um, I've seen in halachic literature that tcheles is a, is, is a term for the wool, which is why psil tcheles has to be blue wool and not blue linen, and that's why it overrides shotness to put it on a linen garment. But in any case, the only form in which the word adom, so you're starting now with the, with the bottom of the spectrum, or the bottom of the visible spectrum. Uh, the only form in which the word uh, root Adam appears in scripture is as Adam man. Adama is undoubtedly derived from Adam, thus characterizing the earth as the soil for human dominion, which itself is creative because Adam was named um, because he was made from the earth. Mm-hmm. And Rav Hirsch is saying the earth serves man and therefore is is Adama. It's an opposite, what's it called? And it fits um, it fits Kabbalah for Adam, the masculine form of the word, to be the initiator and Adama be the one that develops, that gives it the potential for that seed to become a full, you know, I'm talking straight reproduction here, okay? Mm -hmm. Right? The masculine starts the process. The feminine is where it gestates. So it would make sense from the dictuk of the words if you 
take the czar's general approach to gender or maybe to sex, I don't know, um, that Adama would be the soil for human dominion, the place where people, the stage on which people, people's actions come to fruition. The earthly world wed to man as Ish, Isha is to Ish, but not in the reverse. And I'm taking Isha is to Ish also as that kind of, you know, the feminine masculine thing going on there. We recognize the root Adam again in Hadom. So here, Rev Hirsch doesn't really mean root. He means some meta concept of root. Uh, the root of Hadom, which means footstool, and also Adon, the root of Oden, the base of a column. So the Oden, the base of the of the um, planks in the Mishkan, is of the same form as Adam, a person, or red Hadom footstool, etc. See, Rav Hirsch has this idea that if letter, if two words are made of phonetically related letters, they are semantically related words. So, okay, that, that's, that's a principle in how he analyzes roots. He, there are entire dictionaries based on this principle. He goes quite far with it. You can, you know, take it or leave it in terms of the science, but, um, Therefore, when he, he doesn't mean root, I don't know what he used in, in German, but when he talks about Adam is the same root as Hadom, he doesn't mean that it's a two-letter root. It's the fact that both Aleph and He are formed in the same part of the mouth, back in the back of the mouth, um, back in the days when we actually pronounced an Aleph as, as something. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Right, and therefore, and similarly, the Mem and the Nun being both nasal, um, that is what makes them part of the same meta root, not the fact that they all share a dalit in the middle. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, we believe that Adam designates a person, man, as Hadom Ragle Shechina, the footstool for the foot of the divine presence, the bearer and agent of the divine, and for God's dominion over the earth. Hadom is nothing other than the object that meets the foot as it moves toward the ground. So basically, to be human is to be God's ottoman. Offering the foot a place of rest and not sparing it the trouble of having to step squarely on the ground. Thus, the, that's why it's similar to a, do, a dome, the bottom of a, of a pillar, the base of a pillar. Thus, the position of a human being between earth and God could hardly be expressed in more significant terms than Adam and Hadom. And it, elsewhere, he talks about Adama being man's fo fo footstool, man's, you know. Second, the second term he, he defines is Yorok. The only other, he, he calls it yellow and green. So it was one thing you'll find in the Gemara is that there are two forms of Yorok. There's Yoroka Beitza and Yoroka Karti. Yoroka Beitza is Yorok like an egg, and that's yellow, unless you overboil the egg. Yoroka Karti is Yorok like a leek, mm -hmm. and that is a green that, that's already bluegrassy kind of green. It's not, it's not right, it's, it's at the other end of the range. It's very close to. Right, it starts looking a little bluish, um, but yeah, Yoroke has that has that broad spectrum. I was going to say two definitions, but it's not really. It covers a broad part of the spectrum that runs from yellow to green. The only form of Yudurish get kuf that root that we find is Yoroke, which is to spit, to cast away from oneself. And the Gemara Yorok is also used for sneezing um, in the more, you know, gross ways of sneezing. Um, I thought it was spitting, like 
No, I said is to spit. Yeah. But the Gemara will also use the word oh. to sneeze out something. Okay. So words. his generalization that the the relevant feature of spitting is to cast away from oneself kind of fits the way the Gemara uses the word. Oh. I mean, that's the aspect of spitting that the that the Gemara, you know, that would fit also, you know, sneezing something out. Tcheles is derived from Kala, not necessarily the marriage Kala, although I've seen dresses about that, as well as jokes, which would me- literally mean the end. I would say the culmination. Right? It's not just, right? It's, it's not just to end, it's to complete. The world didn't end at the end of the Six days. It was completed at the end of the six days. Yeah, more, more like but again, I don't know his original German. What? Uh, like like Tachlitz, I suppose. No, not I suppose exactly like Tachlitz. Yeah. I mean, same. Yeah, you know, same root. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you were and just using like language, 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 and I was well, asking you to stand up for your idea. Hmm? Same spelling, just you need the yod. Right. No, but I mean it's the same root. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, within the spectrum which is shown by the rainbow through the refraction of light, which is present whenever a prism breaks up a ray of light. The Hebrew language combines the colors into three groups in the following order, red, yellow, green, and blue, violet. So that is, instead of seeing seven colors, there are only three words. So it's three sections. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to desciencify this a little Red is the color of the rainbow that is lowest. So even before we knew about refraction and breaking up the white light into the colors, constituent colors, red was the color closest to the ground. And blue violet is the color closest to, uh, furthest from the ground. So it is the tachlis, it is the kala, it is the end of the rainbow the upper edge of the rainbow, the far edge. Um, so although Rav Hirsch is using a very modern idiom, oh, very modern for him, idiom of refraction and um, and physics that Chazal didn't know, you didn't need to know the physics for these symbols to be meaningful. Red is the least refracted ray. It is the closest to the unbroken ray of light that is directly absorbed by matter. This may be, by the way, why a dome, a possibility for why the Adamaza dome is, it may include brown, um, at least in biblical Hebrew, before there was a separate word. Red is light in its first fusion with the terrestrial element, a dome, hadom. Is this not again man? The image of God is reflected in the physical earthly matter, but a little bit beneath. God. The next part of the spectrum is yellow green, your oak. Blue violets at the end of the spectrum, tcheles. The spectrum, all this is to build up the idea that the tcheles in your tzitzis is one of a threeness. Right? The tcheles of the, of the tzitzis is the high end cult third mm-hmm. of, of the threeness that is the spectrum as seen by somebody who is speaking biblical Hebrew. The spectrum visible to our eye ends with the violet ray tcheles, but additional magnitudes of light radiate unseen beyond the visible spectrum. Likewise, the blue expanse of the sky forms the end only of the earth that is visible to us. And so tcheles is simply the bridge that leads thinking man from the visible physical sphere of the terrestrial world to the unseen sphere of heaven beyond. And again, this would have been true to Chazal too, without knowing that there was such a thing as ultraviolet, because it's the far end, it's the sky end of the rainbow, right? It's the sky colored end of the rainbow as well. Um, the basic color of the sanctuary was blue violet, was tcheles. For the law of God originated neither from the light that is contained in earthly matter, nor from the divine spark that is innate in man. 
It was handed to us from beyond the limits of physically visible matter. From, from heaven, you were given to hear his voice. It was handed to us by God himself. If we obey it, the heavens will incline toward us. The color reflecting the splendor of heaven will then enrich man and all things human. Basuli mikdash v'shachanti b'socho. Make for me mikdash and I will dwell within it. And the glory of, of God will dwell in our midst, midst. And this is a famous medrash because Rashi gives it. Um, notice it says b'socham and not b'socho mm -hmm. um, because it's not literally saying that Hashem will dwell in the Mishkan, it's Hashem will dwell in them. You build me a Mishkan, and a, and the glory of God will of God will dwell in us. So I think, well, actually, that's not necessarily what he meant by the, it's our midst. So maybe that medrash is not relevant to the point he's trying to make, but it's a nice medrash anyway. So not so bad that I brought it up. Chelas is the basic color of the sanctuary of the high priest's vestments. The color blue-violet representing heaven and the things of heaven that were revealed to Israel. Tcheles do melayam. The tcheles of, of one sitis is similar to the sea. Vyam do melarakia. The sea is similar to heaven. Rakia lakisia kavod. And, and the sky, the firmament, um, is similar to the throne of glory, right? Hashem's throne. Shanam Ravatachas Raglov Kamase Livna Sasapir. Um in in Parish's Mishpatim, when it describes the vision that the elders and Aaron got um of who was giving the the Ten Commandments, the Sarasadibros, they saw a version of the Merkava vision, except it was a man on a throne and not in a chariot. Um, possibly because Yechezkel was seeing God harnessing his chariot as the Jews were leaving Israel. And and here that metaphor wasn't appropriate. So it, God didn't have to be show himself as being in motion. But whatever it was, it was a vision in the Merkava vision. And under the feet of the man in the throne, Kamasel Livnas Hasapir was a uh, something like Sapir stone um, brickwork. Uh Tohar and like the midst of the heaven in its purity. Sapir um is some blue stone. We don't know what it was. The identification of sapphire with sapir happens in late Latin. In Greek, it's just a blue stone. I recall perhaps Lapis, or well, just think of Lapis last La week, perhaps. La right. Lapis Lazuli is is the other big candidate, if it's not sapphire. And Lapis Lazuli looks like a night sky with stars in it, because it has those, I don't know even what those flakes are, but it has those gold speckles. Um, but I personally lean towards sapphire because um, purity to me does not imply that last word latohar would not imply something that's speckled um this is a big matter of debate on the tchelas facebook group and yes there's an entire facebook group just there discussing um wearing tchelas and how to tie tchelas and what color should tchelas be and lapis lazuli and and sapphire would give you different ideas as to what shade of blue you should be aiming for when you dye your tzitzis. So this becomes a recurring point of debate. Otherwise, I would not know the entire um, etymology. But Sapir also has a, a Hindi cognate, which is Sapphire. Um, so I don't really know. Um, A thread of, I mean, according to Hirsch, though, you should be okay because you got an entire third of the spectrum to match. <laughs> right? So anything from sky blue to, to, to deep indigo would be fine because Tchelis is an entire third of the rainbow. 
But mm-hmm. when I brought that up on the Tchelis list, they were not impressed. Okay. <laughs> I think, I think you know, they wanted to argue when I was killing the fun. A thread of Tchelis color on our garments conferred upon all of us the insignia of our high priestly calling, proclaiming to all of us, Anje Kodesh Tihunli, and you shall be holy people to me. And symbolic, or I guess men, because men are the ones who applicate tzitzis, and symbolically expressing our calling, Vatem Tiyuli Mamalayas Kohanim Begoy Kadosh. You should be for me a kingdom of Kohanim and a holy nation. If we now turn to the Psil Tchelis of our tzitzis, on our tzitzis, we will note that it was precisely this threaded Tchelis color that formed the krichos, the windings, the gadil, the thick knotted part of the cord, the thread wound round gadil from gadol. That's why I define it as thick. The thread ra- wound around the other threads to make a cord. In this sentence, by the way, he's picking sides. So the one who says that there is only one thread of blue is the Ramam and the Raivid. Tosvos and Rashi have two and two, or four and four, if you count the strings as they look, or the whole doubled over string. But he's saying that it's the it's the the only string that's blue is the one that you use to wind the others. In other words, the vocation of the Jew, the Jewish awareness awakened by the Mishkan, that power which is to prevail within us must act to unite all of our kindred forces within the bound of the of the Beit HaMikdash of Hashem's law. Our calling as Jews, our Jewish awareness cannot be separated from our calling as members of humanity. Because it's Rav Hirsch. Um, you know, notice he quotes Mamlech HaKohanim, a nation of priests. Our Kedusha is because we are supposed to be priests with a flock. Not because, you know, we just are supposed to be kadosh. It is certainly not alien to our human vocation. Now, whether it's separate or in addition, it is not alien to just being a good person. The Jew cannot dispense with the requirements of his calling as a person or expects, expect to realize his purpose without the latter. The fulfillment of according to Jews is linked to our calling as Remembers of humanity and serves to perfect us in the fulfillment of the human vocation. The Jew can accomplish his purpose as a Jew only within the context of his purpose as a human being. The highest degree of Jewish perfection is nothing else but the highest level of accomplishment in human destiny. Why does he bring all this? Thus, too, the winding of the threads at Tzitzis begins and ends with the ordinary thread, the lavan, which is the white thread or the thread that's the color of the garment, used in the making of man's garments, taking the tchelet threads into the center. Tana kishuhum, so the tchelet threads are now aiming the white ones. Tana kishuhum aschil belavan hakanaf min hakanaf. You have to, when you wind, you have to start with a white winding because um, it says hakanaf, so it should be minakanaf from the same type of string as the corner itself is made of. Ukashu Messiah, Messiah Belavan. And when you finish, you should also finish with white, Malin Bakodesh Velomaridin, because you go up in holiness, you don't go down. What does that Malin Bakodesh Velomaridin mean? He struggles with it. First, he gives you Rashi. Min kanaf tchela. So it should be white, which is of the corner. Afterwards, you wind with the blue thread. Since the verse starts by saying it should be of the same type as the corner, you conclude that it's important. So then the whole significance and importance that you're giving the white thread would be insult, would be defied if you ended with tchelas, mm-hmm. right? It would be brought down. So the end of the tzitzis will be lower than the than the beginning of the tzitzis. The Muge Yosef explains. Lo mishum, so this is now later than Rashi. Lo mishum natov min he doesn't mean malin bekodesh, lomo reading, that going from white to blue 
would be lowering and kavod because white is the better of the two. Shatcheles domen lekise a kavod. Tcheles is similar to the in color to the you know the divine throne. Ella de kivan de haloso lelav on tchila mitama kanaf mina kanaf. Since we raised up the love on first, because it had to be of the first winding had to be of the corner. Ain Morida no so, we don't insult the white thread, we don't lower the white thread. The Yasumi Menu Kasha Ha Akron Shahu Kiyama Binyan. And therefore we make it the last winding, which is the final thing that that gives permanence to the structure. Came Parish Rashi, which shouldn't be news because that was the way I read Rashi. <laughs> Ramam interprets it as follows. The last winding is white because you started with white. Because we start with white, you end with, you end with it. Since one ends with the same type of thread as one begins, the concept of Malam Velomaridim in this context requires further comment, and he doesn't really have an answer. So what are we doing with the two strings? We're using blue out of the three colors <coughs> to symbolize something that's uniquely the Jewish calling, the highest of the three. And we're using white to symbolize the human calling. And we're taking the blue and using it to give to channel and direct the white. That's his understanding at Sitsis. Um, I'm wondering if the white is a version of, of what's it called? If the white is a version of the same kind of symbolism as green. In other words, the middle, right? The middle, which is the mind and the world, the e the all the consciousness and uniquely hu human stuff happens, right? Would be green. Green is growth, right? Tzitzis, the white strings are tzitzis, are sprouts. Right, but we're dealing with white, we're dealing with purity, we're dealing with un unbiased thought, we're dealing with whatever. Um, but I'm wondering if it's not also a, a Ruach symbol. Mm -hmm. Next, the, he, he further develops his theme. So we, we, can't, we shouldn't really stop here, but we're gonna have to because it's 927. Um, he's gonna develop the same theme with the number six, seven, and eight. And that's that's this last piece. So before you you before we lay to rest the subject of the three colors, he's going to um, assert that the eighth blue string has meaning because of six, seven, and eight, and he's going to deal with the six days of the week, seventh is Shabbos. What is eight? Eighth day of the bris. So this symbology is going to be furthered with the number of strings. Um, a lot of what he says on numbers, he actually says on bris mila. And just scrolling down over here, this is the way I tie my tzitzis. Um, from a picture that I posted on said Tchelas group. So you notice the first three windings are white. And the last mm -hmm. three windings are white. Mm -hmm. um, there's a law that the windings should be in groups of three. There are different ways of making groups of three. And I happen to do alternating colors for reasons that really have nothing to do with our general topic. Um, so that's where we're going with the, that's, you know, once we do the symbolisms of three and six, seven, and eight, um well yeah we'll close up three we'll deal more on relationships in more modern sources um ravolbi who we'll be doing next is he passed away in the 2000 mid 
Well, the, some sometime earlier, middle of the first decade of this century. So, like, you know, we were all alive and married, I think, when he passed away. So that's pretty contemporary. Um, so that's the uh, that's the the next uh, source, and then I hope to jump back a little and learn the um, the Kuntras Hachesed of Rav Dessler. So I took, Kuntras Hachesed is more than one letter from Mechtav Meliyahu. And it, it's scattered in more than one piece in Mechtav Meliyahu. And I just put it together in one PDF. The, 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 the two pieces. Um, so, uh, in fact, that uh, asking Alan if there were any other pieces that I missed. Um, and I asked Avi too.